This is Real Estate Rookie. Well, it's happened. Bigger Pockets is putting me on this solo episode. So we have no idea what's going to happen without Tony to rein me in uh, on these episodes. But we are going to be here to listen to some nightmare horror stories. So throughout my years as a landlord, property manager, and an investor, uh, there's been a lot of crazy things that have happened to me. And I've also heard a ton of other crazy stories from different investors. And even just joining the Real Estate Rookie Facebook group or the Bigger Pockets forums, you'll hear some of these things that can happen. And as a new investor, some of these things can keep you up at night, but also stop you from taking action because you're so afraid of that worst case scenario. So what we're going to do on this episode is we are going to hear all these worst case scenarios that are going to happen or not going to happen, but could happen. And you are going to know exactly how to handle it, what to do, what your options are, who you need on your team to make sure you can either prevent this or how to handle the situation when it happens. So sit back, relax, get into your coziest sweatsuit, and we're going to hear some true horror stories. Mitch, welcome to the show. Thank you uh, so much for joining me for a little therapy session today on some traumatizing deal that you had happen to you. Yeah, thanks, Ash, for... uh for bringing me on and working through this. It was definitely an interesting project. And, you know, it's not always easy to talk about, you know, something that has happened to you that's not always the best case scenario or that is a painful experience to kind of go through this deal. I know I can think off a couple deals off the top of my head where I don't want to talk about them anymore and I don't want to think <laughs> about them. So thank you for coming on to, to share your experience with everyone. So, they can learn. And if this ever happens to somebody else, they have some of these same issues that they had, that you had, then they can just kind of look back and be like, I remember this guy from the Real Estate Rookie episode had this issue and this is how I solve it. So Mitch, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, a grow house being hospitalized, uh, a year long rehab, and also, you're also going to give us a secret market that you have found for short-term rental too at the end of this episode, which I am excited to dive into. But first, why don't you set the picture for us when you're ready to purchase? And this was your first deal you're going to talk about today, correct? Correct. Yeah, it was my first. Uh, I did own my main residence at the time that was uh, you know, a live and flip type of situation, but this was my first full out going to be an investment property from the start. So kind of set the picture for us. Uh, where are you at in your time of life? Um, where are you working? Uh, where are you living? What's going on in your life when you purchase this deal? Yeah. Um, so I was at my uh, company for a couple of years. Um, knew I wanted to get into real estate more and more. Uh, I wasn't actually expecting to jump into a property that was going to be an investment property at that time, really at all. Um, my thought process was, you know, work on my main residence and then, you know, kind of do the whole birth situation, flip, uh, fix that up and then eventually make that a rental. But a opportunity presented itself. Um, and I thought, why not? Let's go for it. Uh, definitely really didn't think twice about it. Just kind of jumped all in. And, uh, as you'll kind of hear, as you hear my story, that's definitely the action that I kind of took throughout the whole process. Some good things happened from it. Some lessons happened from it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it popped up because I always talk uh, real estate with some coworkers. Uh, actually, it was from my supervisor. What kind of drew you to real estate in the first place to even start looking at it? Um, so there was a, a, a couple of you know people that were around my family. Um, definitely we're a little bit, you could tell a little bit more comfortable financially. Um, and so kind of just asking what their background is. They all had W2 jobs, uh, but they also all invested in real estate. And that was kind of what made it possible for them to live the lifestyle that they had. Uh, and then the more and more I researched, uh, obviously real estate popped up, bigger pockets popped up. Um, and it just, it, it everything kind of seemed to filter back to, uh, you know, real estate. And between that and I loved the game Monopoly growing up. I didn't understand why. I had no understanding as to this will hopefully be my life down the road. Now uh, it all connects. It becomes full circle. 
Exactly. I mean, I love that game. I couldn't get anybody to play it with me growing up because it was too long. But, uh, I mean, I took interest in it real quick. Um, and I still do to this day. It's, it's what I do when I'm, you know, watching football games. I'm on the side zillowing it up. And so, yeah, it was just always been an interest. Okay. So what year is this that you're purchasing this deal and you, you find it? So it is, uh, the very, very end of 2018. Um, like we're talking December, uh, is when I first heard about the property, um, and walked the property. Okay. And before I had cut you off before earlier, you said it was, you were talking with your supervisor. Is that how you found the deal? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, my supervisor, I mean, he's a great guy. Uh, we get along super well and he's really into the finance stock market, real estate. He's just, he's fascinated with all of it. So he jumped in, uh, uh, a couple months before that, and he got two properties from somebody he knew that were kind of was deloading their portfolio. Um, the second property he had, he started working on first. And the gentleman who he had uh, working on the property was living in the second. So he was kind of trading that rent for work situation, um, which based off of his and kind of everything I learned, it, you, it's kind of a no-no kind of muckies the water a little bit, you know? Um, but they kind of went through it and let's just say after the first property, he wanted nothing to do with the second property. He just wanted to sell it. He wanted to, he just, he didn't deal with that stress very well. So I was like, perfect. Let, let, let me deal with the headache and see what I can do. So, uh, I essentially walked the property and at that time it seemed perfectly fine. Um, there was a section of the basement that was locked off, but it was, to my understanding, uh, they had dogs. So I just figured, okay, the dogs might be in there. Um, but everything else, it was beat up a little bit messy. Um, but it seemed, uh, like a good buy. It was a kind of a, a market place in the market place. And it is in Columbus, Ohio. Um, that was on the borderline of what has already been flipped and what is going to be flipped. And it was one of those main roads that on one side of the road, you're, you're pretty good on the other side of the road, it gets a little bit rough. And then if you go one main exit down further, um, it gets really rough, but it was definitely a transition period, um, for that area. And I kind of understood that with talking with some local guys that are involved with real estate. And so I was able to kind of get on it a little bit early, how you were analyzing your market. And do you think this played into an advantage that you were investing where you have lived in areas that you have known? Yeah, it was, it was a huge advantage. Um, just being able to, you know, drive for dollars, um, kind of in that area and then going back, you know, to each direction of the neighborhood. It, it's, it's night and day at that time when I bought the house. Um, the street that my house was on. One out of every six, you know, landscaping is really nice, new windows. Um, and then it's right next to houses that, uh, you know, have plywood over the windows and yards not taken care of. There's garbage all over. Um, but then as you kind of drove back, you, you saw it was everything was kind of rehabbed. And then as you went south, um, it got worse and worse. Um, you could tell with, you know, just certain living situations, the amount of trash piled up, just the, the, the quality, I guess, or how much people took care of their house, it, it drastically changed. And I'm talking within a half mile. Um, it went from, I guess, what people would consider a B, B minus C plus neighborhood to, uh, a D, D minus, uh, you know, type of area. Yeah. And let's just kind of break that down real quick for anyone that doesn't understand that kind of grading system, because there is no set hard and fast rule that this right here is what means it's a C area. This right here is what it means to be a B area. So could you just clarify real quick some of the things you use when you are determining what type of class an area is? So why would you say that one area is a C minus? What are some of the indicators for you? Um, well, a big a big indicator, uh, it would be, you know, the trash kind of laying around. I'm not talking just a little bit of stuff here and there. I'm talking, you know, your hoarder situation. Um the boarded up windows is a huge red flag. Um, unless you're, you know, you're, you're okay with taking on a property and usually those type of properties lead to, uh, 
rough rental situations. Um, some people love it because a lot of times those properties can cash flow if you're willing to put up with that. Uh, other times, a lot of people aren't because you are going to get headaches in those areas. So for me, that C minus is, you know, I'm okay with starting in it, but I don't want my property to end in that situation once I'm up and running. Um, whereas, you know, a B, a B minus, I think, I think of is, is your working class. You know, it's somebody who has a steady 40 hour job. Um, you might not be, you know, a, a you know, a highly paying job, but it's consistent. They can afford rent, um, you know, type of situation. So what was the property that you purchased? What did it look like? Was it one with trash outside? Was there boarded up windows? Was it nice on the exterior and beautifully redone? And, uh, what, what did you pay for it? So the, the, I ended up paying 36, five for the, for the property. Um, I know now. I just want you to know how many people are cringing right now that <laughs> there are still properties out there for $36,500. Yes, it was, uh, like I said, I, I did know the, the gentleman who owned it. Um, he bought, he got the two properties super, super cheap. It actually gave him a couple thousand dollar profit. Uh, but he was also excited that. I was excited to get started. So I think he kind of like helped me out there in that situation. Um, but in terms of the, the property, when I first walked it, it, it was a little bit messy. There was garbage on the inside. The outside wasn't terrible. Um, the windows were boarded up for the, you know, there was a couple that were boarded up here and there. Um, you know, it was a little bit rough. Now, by the time I closed on it, and then I had to go through an eviction process pretty much immediately. Um, and then that took me through the holidays, which kind of extended that a little bit. Um, and then once I eventually got into the property, uh, I think all but one window was boarded up. Uh, the garbage was up t past your knees. Um, inside the house or outside of it? Inside the house. Oh I mean, it God. was... So when we, when we walked the property, um, should I talk about them taking over the property right now? Yeah. Go into what it's like when, when you're first purchasing it and even maybe talk a little bit about your due diligence period too. So before you even closed on it, what are some of the things that made you feel confident as a new investor? These are things that you decided that I can take on this deal. These are the things I'm confident on. So in terms of the, the, uh, quality of that, uh, you know, of the house, uh, whatever's wrong with the house, I'm pretty confident that, I, you know, I'm going to be able to uh, work on myself, fix it. Um, I grew up my, I guess my house that I grew up in, you could say was a full-time live, you know, live in, it's not really a live and flip, but live and add on. Uh, my dad's very handy. He's one of those uh, very, you know, talented individuals that just somehow figure stuff out. Jack of all trades. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, he's just, he's good at whatever he wants to be good at. It's sometimes annoying. It's like, how did you do that so easily? You know? Uh, but you know, that taught me at a young age that it's okay to just jump in and, and do things yourself. Um, so with looking at what I knew I was going to be able to get the property and then looking at what other houses have recently sold for, that were also still beat up. Um, I was like thirty to forty thousand dollars under what people were buying it for, and then houses that were recently renovated um, within that. I mean, we're talking less than a quarter mile now. You know, above that road that it's on, um, were being you know uh, appraised for about a hundred thousand. So I'm like, I got, I could screw up multiple times and still end up, you know where the rest of the house are being appraised for. So in terms of what I'm buying it for, what it needs to go into, you know, I had a lot of safety net there, um, which I think also helped me just jump into it and was like, let's figure this out as we go. So now that you've closed on the, the property and you have this huge wiggle room that if there are expenses that come up, you're not expecting, you have room to still make the deal work for you based on the, the, the comps in the area for the ARV. And so what I want to know though is, okay, you said you had to do an eviction. So from the time you close on the property, how long did it take for the eviction to happen? And you mentioned four feet of garbage. So is this just them 
trashing the place or is this how they actually lived in the property? Oh, I, I, I hope to God they didn't live in the property. I hope they were only using it for their business, which we'll get into. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how anyone could live in that and it, it, it makes you sick. Um, you know, I did, I sent you some of the photos and, it, you know, you're more than welcome to show those online. I, I would hope that no one had to live in these situations. Uh, but yeah, the, from the point where I walked the property and was feeling pretty good, I'm like, all right, this isn't going to be bad to when I took over. They went full send on just destroying this place. Um, the, the current tenant, you know, started violating the, the contract that was already in hand. Um, I meet, I knew I did not want to property manage it myself because I had no clue what I was doing with a tenant. I had no clue how to do a background check. Um, so I needed to get somebody in there who's been there, done that, and who's worked in this area while it's been being converted from what it was to what it's becoming, right? Um, so I found a gentleman here who kind of deals with the uh, rougher areas of Columbus, Ohio, kind of told him the situation, you know, gave him, talked to him what the current lease was about, uh, and the lease was already kind of been breached, so we could act immediately on the eviction process. Uh, that took roughly, for Columbus, it, it's pretty quick, um, and he's kind of been there, done that. And so he knew the system. He knew the people involved with the system. So, uh, it took, uh, if I remember correctly, about a three to three and a half week period. Um, and that was dealing with the holidays as well with offices being closed. So it was, it was pretty quick. Would you say that Ohio is a tenant friendly or landlord friendly state? Which way does it lean more? As, as far as I know, it was extremely landlord friendly compared to what, you know, I've heard other people had to deal with, you know, the, their, their horror stories and trying to evict people. So yeah, it was, you know, it was very friendly. Um, how much did it cost to have him do this eviction and to hire him? Uh, so the, the hiring in terms of, you know, he takes a, uh, you know, a certain percentage. I did have to cut a check for the lawyer for the court fees and all that. And it wasn't very much. It was like $500. Um, so for $500, you know, they're taking care of getting this person out that obviously, you know, did not take care of the property whatsoever. Um, and that's a home run every day. You know, I, $500 to not have to deal with that, uh, I think is a no brainer. I 100% agree. And I think that's a, a great price, especially for how fast you were able to get a resident out because it definitely takes a lot longer than, uh, in New York state than <laughs> it does for you. But, um, I think it is very much worth it to pay a professional than to try to figure it out yourself. And the first eviction I ever had to do when I was a property manager, the owner of the property said to me, I want you to figure it out. I think you could do it. The old property managers I had, they did it. They didn't have an attorney or anything. The judge made me cry. I was in tears. She's like, <laughs> I'm going to give you a minute because there was two back to back evictions. And she's like, I'm not going to embarrass you in front of the next person. I'm just going to tell them the case was dismissed and <laughs> you can go back and Ooh, read the paperwork man. because I did it all wrong. The timelines, the time frame as to like when this had to be done, this had to be done. And it was awful. And I'm like trying to hide back my tears as I'm tearing up. I'm like, okay. And after that, I was said to the owner, I said, it is going to cost you more money because now we have to redo everything. And yes, I'll probably eventually learn, but it is so much more cost effective to just hire an attorney who knows how to do it and can just take care of it. So, um, I appreciate my attorney so much who handles these. He, you know, he talks with the residents, tries to negotiate with them. He goes w way above and beyond what it actually costs to have a, a tenant that's in delinquency and having me try and figure it out and handle it and schedule court dates and schedule the marshal to come and all these different things. So I think that is definitely something that is really worth outsourcing. And yes, for your first property, $500 is a lot to, to add. Too. If you are, you know, you're not having any rent coming in because you're evicting that person, you're about to spend this whole rehab and, but at least you got to get started sooner than if you maybe tried to figure it out and it, you know, went on longer than you would have anticipated and probably hurt you in the long run. So now that they're out, 
the fun begins. Did you find any treasures in there? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it was in today's today with new laws being passed, I might've been okay. I might've been able to pay for my house with it. But uh, yeah, actually the day they're going to essentially, you know, haul the people out in handcuffs if they weren't out. Um, my property manager told me they were literally pulling in as the ex renters were pulling out and they go in and I'm doing, I'm at my W2 job at this point. And I'm like, do I need to be there for this? Like, I, I want to be involved because I'm excited to get going. And he's like, no, we'll take care of this. So uh, I, they're going around. I, it was like roughly around 11 o'clock they were supposed to go. And my phone rings a little bit later. And I pick up and it's my property manager. And there, there is no hello. There is no, it went great. He simply goes, what did you get us into? Oh, no. Was his first word. So you can imagine, you know, I'm already excited. I'm already kind of slightly nervous. And those are the first words out of your property manager. And I'm like, oh, crap. Oh, no. What happened? Does your heart just like drop at that moment as to yeah. what do you mean? Yeah. It, it was like being on a roller coaster. Or do you even <laughs> or do you kind of get like a little defensive as to, well, it, it has great potential, like trying to, you know, prove <laughs> yourself because I feel like that's how I would be. I'd be like so excited to dive in there. And then somebody tells me like, uh, what did you buy? Like this? is awful. I feel like I would go into like defense mode. Like it, it has potential. Like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll be great. I promise. Oh no. So they had to, they had to, uh, they informed me that the Columbus police department was now over my property. And I'm like, what happened during this? I'm thinking maybe there was a scuffle, you know, before I got told that they were leaving. And it turns out that uh, the basement, the section that I was not able to walk during my original walkthrough. And why was that? It was just. It was locked up, to be honest with you. And I, I don't, you know, I didn't know. I asked, do we have the keys for this? Um, and, you know, from the rest of the house, I was thinking it's, it's more the same. And I was like, I thought maybe the dogs were on the other side. Um, turns out it was a, a massive grow production. Um, these people, and if, if you see the photos, it's like a scene from Breaking Bad. You had it had it all plastic off. There was fans. They had HVAC ventilation running. The lights were on a track. I mean, these guys were brilliant with what they were doing. I mean, they definitely knew what they were doing, and they were being successful because they evidently hauled a bunch out. Uh, so they're growing plants in the basement. Uh, but uh, the thing is, there was no – the water was off. There was no electric. There was no heat. They were stealing electric from, I later found out they were stealing electric from the old man next door. Just like from an exterior outlet, they were just plugging in to? Correct. They were, they were plugging onto different outlets. And to kind of give you some background of the type of people we were dealing with here, uh, he informed me that he kept throwing the extension cord back. He knew that it probably was a, a wasn't a good situation they had going on. He didn't want anything to do with it, but they didn't, he didn't want him stealing his electric. So at one point he ends up throwing the electric cords over the fence. And next thing he knew, he hears is he hears dogs barking. These people let loose their guard dogs and they attack the old man and actually put the old man in the hospital. Oh my gosh. So, I mean, that goes to show it was definitely worth hiring a property manager for the eviction. Cause I didn't have to ever have to deal with these people. You didn't have to get attacked by a dog. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, it, it was, it was like something no other. So my property manager's like, we're going to finish up here. Like, I'm like, in my head, I'm like, am I in trouble? Like, because I own this property. Like, how's this work? Okay, Mitch. So you have law enforcement on your lawn of your first ever, ever rental property. And uh, what happens? Are you hauled off to jail? Uh, are you uh, phoning <laughs> in from prison right now for <laughs> growing marijuana? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, so obviously my, you know, my property manager had records of, you know, when I took over the house, the days that they posted, cause you have to post flyers, like you have one week left, you have five days left. Like this is the day we're coming. So they get warning shot after warning shot that they're going, um, or that we're coming in. So evidently there was proof enough that essentially I had nothing to do with what was going on. Um, I am just taking over the property. Um, so I actually, I never even had to talk to Columbus police department, my property manager, the lawyers, they took care of everything. Um, so once again, just, you know, tip my hat to them, um, with how they handled this, the situation. So, um, that night, uh, my property manager's like, well, we're going to get this all locked up. You know, you can come get the keys at the end of your workday. 
So this is December. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry. This is the beginning of January and it's freezing. Uh, I go to private manager, get the keys. He says, everything's boarded up except the back door. I'm like, okay. So I walk, you know, I get to the house. It's dark out. Once again, no electric. And I go around back and the back door is wide open. And I'm like, what the heck? I walk in. It's been broken into and to there to the point where there's just stuff everywhere around the, the kitchen. I mean, garbage. There's there's gasoline containers. There's there was literally a, a machete on the counter. You know, I'm just like, what? Did you keep that? A souvenir? <laughs> oh, I, I have. I put it. Actually, I that was a tool I ended up using a decent amount, which we joked about, you know, during the renovation. Stuff. I have a sword from a, a house before that I found too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. But in my head, I'm like, shoot, like, are these people still in there? Right. Yeah. Are going to come back? Right. So I call up my one buddy. I'm like, hey, look, I'm about to walk, walk this property. You don't need to come in with me. But, you know, if... Everything goes wrong. If you hear screaming, call the police immediately. You know, so I wait. I'm I'm at the back door. He comes around, and it's like a scene from Cops at this point, right? We got the headlamps going. Uh, I grab the you know the machete off the counter. He's got like a little pocket knife, and we're walking this house room by room. Uh, I do have the GoPro video somewhere of the first time walking this, right? And so we walked into the room. No one was in there, but. There was brand new holes wa- busted in the wall. Um, there was some money filtered out. Well, here they broke back in um, because they ha- evidently had some drugs and money stored throughout the house that they wanted to make sure they captured that they didn't have time to get before the sheriff showed up earlier that day. So, you know, starting at that point, um, I-, I remember I FaceTimed my mom uh, and dad. You know, that night after everything, I didn't tell them any about any of that situation. Uh, but I walked through and they're like, oh, oh, well, I later found out my mom called my sisters and started crying. Like, oh. what is he doing? Uh, you know, my Mama Kratz is an absolute saint, but she was like, I, I don't know what he's thinking, but that place is a disaster. Um, so then, you know, starting at that point, you know, relocked everything up. Uh Got everything kind of cleaned out. And at that point, there was a couple nights where I was still nervous because the windows haven't been replaced. You can't really see inside the house. Um, and so I actually pulled up an air mattress and slept on the couch and not, you know, to just in case someone was like coming in like that first couple of weeks, I was, you know, I stayed over there a few nights just because I was, I had my tools over there. I finished working on the house or doing what I was working on at like 2 a.m. I didn't want to take all my tools out. And so I just, I, I stayed there. Um, and at that point, you know, it was a week where we're having kind of weather similar to now where it's sub zero degrees. Well, I called the gas company. I can't get the gas turned on to heat the house. So I actually was heating the house with propane tanks down in the basement while sleeping. I'm like, man, this wasn't the safest situation for me. But uh, luckily, it all worked out in the end. So so. A propane tank exploding. You were at risk of uh, somebody (laughs) coming in and attacking you to get more money out of the walls. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) the list goes on here or freezing to death. But um, okay, so already this is an an adventure for you. And it is funny, like listening to what you sacrifice and do. And as a, a new investor, as a rookie investor, like this is your baby, your first investment. So how long did the rehab end up taking and what were those lessons learned that you had from this deal? Um, it took just over a year to finish and it was, uh, we did pretty much everything on it. And you did all the work yourself, you and your dad? All the work, me and my pops. My pops came down, um, you know, quite a bit of weekends, which was nice. Actually, I kind of like look back and reflect on, um, you know, I, I got I got to learn a lot. Um, and just, you know, we had games on the radio. It like reminded me of childhood of him working on our house and me getting in the way of him trying to work on our house, you know? So that was, that was actually really nice and enjoyable, but, uh, it took, yeah, just over a year in a house, uh, one big lesson and you're, you guys are going to laugh at this, but always tie down your stuff when you're hauling it in the back of the truck. Um, I actually bought one of those all in one shower tub from home Depot. And I loaded up everything, like all the the plumbing stuff, all the fixtures, and uh, you know, probably close to like two thousand dollars worth of material in the back of my truck. 
And so me and my dad are driving from Home, Te- Home Depot down 70 one day um, with all of this loaded and a semi goes flying past me and this thing lifts straight up and falls out the back of my truck. I see it going down. I like swerve it. So luckily this big fiberglass thing ended up falling to the side of the road, but all of my fixtures, uh, all of my plumbing pipes, everything is just scattered on 70. Just blew out. Oh my God. So, I mean, people are running over these pipe things and they're like whizzing past you. It was like real life fro- uh, Frogger, swear. Honestly, that's more of a nightmare than finding a grow house going on in one of my properties. Is that happening to me? If some, If I'm riding with somebody and they say, Ashley, just watch the back. Make sure, you know, it's okay. It's tied down good or whatever. Like, no, I can't. I will, <laughs> I can't do that. That's too much pressure because I'm already nervous that it's going to fly out and it's going to hit the car behind us. Like, that is a nightmare for me. And also, it's scattered across the road. And there was somebody that had a, their suitcase fly out that was on the side of the road the other day. And I was like, that's worse too. just going and picking up this, their belongings, you know, their broken suitcase. I just don't ever want that to be me. It was, it was terrible. My dad like tried to joke about it later that day. And I looked at him like, really? <laughs> yeah, too soon, dad. Yeah. Too soon. I'm like, he's like, if I don't make you laugh, it's something that you can cry about, like live and learn, you know? <laughs> so we didn't even get majority of it back. It was, it was a mess, but, uh, so, but yeah, I mean, I mean, the rehab, we ended up redoing everything, the bathroom, the kitchen, um, got the flooring done. Pretty much the only couple things I did hire out, I found a great window guy um, in Columbus. He came in, great price, and I, I've actually used him at my personal house, and I try to use him for another property in another location, uh, but it was a little bit too far from him, um, and then I got the floors redone, but everything else was, you know, uh, done little by little. I did a little traveling during that year. So that d- took up some time. You know, I was, I was in Japan for almost two weeks during that year. What did that rehab end up costing on that? What did you end up putting into it? Well, because I did everything myself, um, it, it was just under like 25,000, um, to the best of my knowledge. Okay. And have you had it appraised or? So I had it, uh, I actually cashed out refinance when I finished refinished it. Um, I haven't done it again. Uh, right now the market's like 175. Uh, I was able to cash out refinance for 135 when I finished it. So all in you were 60,000? Zero. Well, I mean, uh, but when you, your purchase price was what, 36,000? Yeah. About 36,000. Yep. Yeah. And then 25,000 into it. Yep. But I actually did, uh, um, traditional bank financing when I first bought it. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I I didn't know any better. I just thought that's where people got their money from was from banks. I'm like super curious because a lot of banks that I've run into, they won't even do a loan for that low because it's just not worth it for them. Right. Well, uh, so when I did when I did the financing for my main house, um, I had like a three ring binder that had like everything completely organized, tagged, like overkilled like crazy, and I ha- and I handed it to my. Uh, my lender when I had to do the paperwork. And so me and him got along real well because that made his job job easy. So then when I went to this uh, investment property and I was like, Hey, can you do this? He brought that up. He's like, man, this is, he goes, we don't typically do this. He's like, but uh, me and him kind of had a conversation that I want to get involved with real estate. I want more and more property. So you built that rapport with him and right. Cool. And that was, it must've been a small local bank where they have more flexibility as to what they can do. Yeah. Correct. And my, my uh, realtor is the one that actually brought it to my, uh, is who connected. I had a great realtor in Columbus. It's amazing how your network can connect you to other people that you don't even plan on meeting, you know, and having those relationships develop. So what are uh, a couple of the other lessons learned? Was there anything, um, as far as being a landlord, being, um, you know, having your own business for the first time, different things like that, that you may have learned lessons on. Yeah. I, uh, I definitely wish I would have ran it more like a business and not, uh, you know, something I'm just doing on the side, um, in terms of a little bit more organization of when I'm, what I'm working on, when I'm working on it, maybe a little bit more understanding of how I'm going to budget out to get things done, just to make the whole process faster. Um, take a better look at what would have been worth to outsource, you know, sure. I say, maybe I saved a couple hundred bucks by doing it myself, but it took me two weeks to do it when someone can come knock it off in a day or two. 
you know, um, just a little more pre-planning. Um, and then, uh, definitely better bookkeeping. And I, and I'm seeing that kind of come back and bite me a little bit down the road, um, when it comes to, you know, your tax write-offs, um, and helping to budget for future, you know, renovations is, I should be able to have a, a resource with a binder of, you know, timeline, how long stuff took for me to do, um, and prices. And obviously that stuff all varies, but definitely at least a starting kit. And I don't because I just dove in and just did it without being organized. Like I said, it was a side hobby. It wasn't a business. I think a lot of people do that. I mean, I did that. And going back, I wish I would have done the same thing because there was a lot of properties I just dove into. And it's like, okay, I know how to do bookkeeping. I, I was an accountant and I have this, but I never like put the systems and processes in place to actually just have it roll. Each one, I had to redo everything. And yeah, so uh, definitely a lot of learning experience. As much as you want to jump in and take action right away, there are some things that you should be implementing now so that when that property, that deal comes up, you're ready to take action. So Mitch, one thing that we had, um, I had seen in your application when we kind of talked about coming on the show to talk about this is during this time, you were actually hospitalized too which just made the whole rehab process uh, worse for you. And um, you want to tell us about that quickly, briefly before we wrap up? Yeah. Um, there, there was a couple of times where I probably actually could have gone in. I, I, I There was another time where a, a ladder ended up giving out and while well, I was climbing up on the roof. So I ended up falling, in, falling into a mess of stuff from the roof. Uh, but the it did wear me down. Um, it was there was a lot of funk in that house, I guess is a nice way to put it. Uh, so I'm not sure how or why, but it, it definitely beat me up mentally and physically. Um, and to the point where I somehow, somehow way end up catching, you know, meningitis towards the end of it. Um, I had meningitis, I had shingles and because of the spinal tap, uh, that didn't repatch, I was leaking spinal fluid as well. Um, which if anyone has ever gone through it, the headaches that you get from that is, uh, something I wouldn't want to wish on anybody. Uh, so yeah, it was just, it, you could definitely tell that it, it broke you down because it, the, the normal day was, you know, work from seven 30 to four 30, try to get a workout in from five to six 30 and then work in the house from six 30 to one or 2 AM repeat. And it's not sustainable. Um, I'm, you know, working on my second, property now and I'm, I'm doing the same thing. Um, and I already know in my head, I'm a little bit more organized this time. I'm, I'm writing down the things I definitely want to outsource the things I actually enjoy doing. And I maybe always want to do or prefer to do myself. Um, yeah, it's just, you'll get burnt out if you try to do everything yourself and not organized. So it was definitely an experience. Um, didn't realize the whole, uh, uh, how severe meningitis can be. Yeah, definitely scary. Yeah, I was sick in the hospital and, you know, I got the, va I'm vaccinated and all that, but somehow I caught it and my whole family's down. I'm like, why are you guys here? I'm just tired. Um, I'm actually named after uh, my dad's brother who died of meningitis as a little baby. So like that would have been poetic if something went wrong, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah weird uh, connection. And yeah, I, I mean, kind of scary as you're thinking about it in the moment as you have, meningitis yeah 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 and and when this all went down i was i was a uh, i was like a like rounding third and halfway to home with the whole renovation so i'm just like wanting to get back to it wanting to work on it um which just kind of delayed the process probably a, by the time i got up and going again probably a, a, close to another month i i think this is a huge lesson in itself too is that like burnout can happen and as much as you want to be like, on social media, I'm grinding away. Like I'm the hardest worker. I'm up at 5 a.m. I'm, you know, work until midnight. Like there is that burnt out that you don't want to have because like you said, it you got sick and then it causes, you know, a delay um, in your project. And, you know, but I think it's great that you propelled yourself to get that motivation back, because I think that's also something that can be difficult, too, is when you feel that burnout is getting back into the groove of things. And, you know, we don't know per se that your meningitis was caused by that. But um, 
I, you know, I am an investigative journalist, so I did do some research and I did see that there was a woman in California who did get meningitis from smoking weed that had a fungus (laughs) on it. So I want to know, were you smoking weed that you found (laughs) in that house? (laughs) Because it sounds like it could be a dirty house and a fungus growing. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I wouldn't deny that there was definitely some funk in the house, but <laughs> no, uh, sadly, the co- the cops took it all when they first came into the property, so I didn't, didn't get any benefits from it. Well, I'm glad you're feeling better, and uh, to kind of wrap up the show today, you do have a secret to tell everyone as far as this little uh, market that you have found for short-term rental, and you're currently working on a project there, so do you mind sharing with everyone where that market is and just give us a little recap as to why you think this is um, the next up and coming short term rental market. Yeah. So um, I, you know, I came across the area because it's actually my hometown area. Um, you know, growing up when I graduated high school, uh, I'm going to age myself now back in 2009, uh, there was a couple of wineries, you know, that people would come and there's live music during and ever since then uh there's now just under 40 uh 40 wineries within this little you know five to ten mile radius in northeastern ohio right on the lake so you know you you have all the lake opportunities that's actually you know during the summers when people actually want to visit cleveland because it's not freezing um and then you have, you know, all these, you know, different wineries with the music and you're starting to see a lot of PA and a lot of New York. Is there a wine trail like established there? Like uh, I know near me, there's like the Niagara wine trail or whatever. Is this one have a name to it? Not yet. I honestly think, you know, Geneva and Madison are doing a terrible job marketing it because a lot of people don't know about it unless it's word of mouth. Um, but it is it's growing. It's, it's exploding. Um, and there's also a, uh, state of the art Olympic training facility that's on the Geneva exit, which is I think three miles down the freeway. And you have literally thousands of viable AAU players and basketball players. Um, this is where, you know, uh, NCAA, the Mac championship indoor track and swimming and everything's hosted. So you have a lot of things being pulled to this area that is just underdeveloped and is not ready for it. To be honest with you, um, there's only a couple hotels within the few exits, um, that were just put up a couple years ago. So it's, it's a sweet little spot and, uh, it's still, it's still farm cheap, as I like to say, you know, in Northeast Ohio. So just giving us an idea, what did you purchase your property there for? So um, I actually went in on it with my sister. Um, it's my first partner uh, ship, and it's been interesting. Uh, but we, uh, well, it was 156, I believe. Um, we, uh, it came with three acres, but then when we got it surveyed, it actually, because of the variance, um, it actually ended up being a little bit over five acres which is amazing. Um, and it's right along the river. Um, we actually own down by the river. We own uh, 150 feet of river property, which yeah, evidently is a great spot for ice fishing. Who knew? Uh, but I've been told by a bunch of people here in Columbus, like let it snow when you're up and running because we go up there two or three times a winter to ice fish. I'm like, amazing. That's the slope here. So you got ice fishing, the Olympic facilities, and then also you have the wineries right there. So three different kind of industries, you know, instead of like if you're analyzing a long term market, you're kind of looking at what are the three job industries, but you're looking at the three attractions that are happening in that market right there. So that's awesome. Well, Mitch, thank you so much for sharing this little secret with us. I'm sure there's already people that are Googling on Zillow uh, looking for properties right now. But um, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your advice with us. Uh, We are going to close out with the rookie exam. So you got time for uh, three more questions? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Okay. So first question is, what is one actionable thing rookies should do right after listening to this episode? What I would say is, you know, just get started, um, but do it in an organized manner. Um, like I said, I literally decided to 
buy my first investment property three days after it was presented to me with no game plan. Um, so whether you're looking for properly properties and that's a step you're on, uh, or you have the property and you're kind of the next best step, right? Just think it out. Make sure you're not doing it as a hobby. If you, if you really want to do this long term, there, there's many different, you know, ways you can be, you know, successful in real estate, but the fundamentals of, you know, your bookkeeping and your setting up systems, you know, there's a right way and a very wrong way to do it. Um, and I'm speaking from experience of the wrong way. So, uh, definitely just prepare, you know, do it and do it organized in terms of setting up your systems and stuff. And what is one tool, software app that you use in your business today? Uh, I actually started, uh, using QuickBooks. Uh, so, uh, the property, the Airbnb that I'm currently working on and I'm going up essentially if I'm in the state of Ohio, I'm going up on weekends. So that's logging my mileage of driving from Columbus to up past Cleveland, which is like two and a half hours. Um, and that's keep me organized this time around in terms of all my home Depot receipts and stuff like that. You can snap and then everything's filtered right away for you. And the last question is where do you see yourself in five years? Within five years, let's, let's hope, uh, the, my systems are in place. I would love to have, uh, 10 doors by the time I'm 35, um, with maybe one or two additional Airbnbs and locations that I like to visit. So I can kind of use that benefit, but definitely kind of streamline of that small but mighty portfolio. Um, you know, where the goal is to get 10 and then maybe get those paid off before I expand to too much because, I don't want a whole lot I have to look at, but I want it to be, you know, successful of what I've already invested in. Yeah. And Chad Carson writes a great book for bigger pockets called The Small and Mighty Investor. <laughs> yeah, I'm currently reading it right now, actually. So it's really good. Yeah. Okay. And I actually have some extra credit for you. I don't always do this, but Mitch, for you, I have a, another question for a little extra credit. Uh, so looking back, what is one regret? that you have once you started and no, nobody, if you ever get asked this question, not allowed to say you have no regrets spelled R A G R E T S and flash me a tattoo. From <laughs> me. Okay. Go ahead. So, um, I guess my biggest regret is, uh, probably dealing with financing. Um, maybe bringing in, you know, uh, whether that's an equity partner or someone who's just straight cash that's given me a loan, something to help speed up the process. Um, I did have to wait, you know, paychecks to get things done because I'm doing things little by little where if I would have just came with a, like understood what partners are available out there or what funding is available out there that, you know, I have a little bit more knowledge now um, just from, you know, listening to podcasts and stuff. Uh, it, I would be much farther down the road. I'd be closer to my, you know, 10 property goal. Um, and so for that, I did learn a lot. Um, I definitely want to believe you learn from your mistakes and the hard times. Those stick with you longer and they stick out more in your head than your successes. Uh, but it definitely set me back. Well, Mitch, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. And if anyone would like to know more about the Columbus, Ohio market, where Mitch told his horror story today, and you also want to buy a grow house, you can reach out to Mitch. We'll put his information in the show notes, and maybe you can find out some more information about his deal, because I feel like there was a lot that we didn't even get to uncover um, because we were so focused on the the traumatic parts of it. But um, I mean, really a, a great deal in the end. I mean, you were able to refinance at 135,000. Um, so awesome job there, Mitch. I'm glad it worked out for you. And I, one, a couple of the things that I wrote down that I wanted to highlight um, is that you did extremely well building a team. You found a property manager. You had an attorney take over the eviction. You used your real estate agent to help you find a loan officer that would work with you for what you needed on a property. So fantastic job at that, building a team. And then also um, you left 
major room for error. You knew that you could, you know, go way over budget and this, de this deal would still work for you. Um, and then also just building relationships, how you went into that loan officer, building those relationships and, um, you know, having your binder, your information ready. And so, you know, <laughs> building, um, you know, kind of a report with them. So uh, congratulations on that deal and um, on the rest of your journey. Thanks, Ash. If you want to find out more about Mitch, you can check him out in the show description. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, thanks so much for watching. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If you like this episode, please give the thumbs up because this is my first ever solo episode. <laughs> so um, I'm Ashley and uh, Mitch, thanks so much for being my guest slash co-host today. And we will see you guys next time on another episode of Real Estate Rookie. Still, yeah.